Welcome to our webinar on IFRS 5 on non-current assets held for sale and discontinued operations. I'm Raymond Chamboko. I'm going to be your facilitator for this session today. Basically, just to talk through what IFRS 5 entails and the whole rationale behind why the standard exists. IFRS 5 outlines how to account for non-current assets that are held for sale or where we've decided that we will distribute non-current assets to the owners of the organization, the accounting that relates to these sort of transactions is dealt with in terms of this particular standard. Now, just as a bit of an overview in terms of what the standard entails, and to give you a little bit of a rationale behind what the thinking is behind what drives the standard, any assets and disposal groups that are held for sale, once you've decided that you're going to classify them as non-current assets held for sale, will not be depreciated. We'll deal with this a little later on. They're measured at the lower of their carrying amount and fair value, less any cost to sell. They'll also be presented separately in the financial statements. So in your statement of financial position, depending on what sort of um, item we're dealing with, if it's, if it's a disposal group, there may be an impact on your statement of, of comprehensive income as well. And there will also be some specific disclosures that will be required for, for these sort of items, depending on what, 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 sort of what item you're dealing with exactly. Now, the thinking behind it is, as you prepare your financial statements, if you've taken the decision that you are going to discontinue a particular you're going to dispose of a particular asset or discontinue a, the operations of a particular division or a particular subsidiary, for instance. How will the people that are reading your financial statements, the audience of your financial statements, how will they be in a position to understand the impact that such disposal might have on your financial statements? That is basically what drives this particular standard. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move, over, move on to the scope section of the standard. And you'll see in the scope section, it says, it relates to the classification and presentation requirements that apply to all recognized non-current assets and disposal groups that you may have within your group of assets. However, there are certain items, certain assets that are outside of the scope of IFRS 5 when it comes to the measurement requirements of IFRS 5. But the disclosure requirements of IFRS 5 will still, will still apply. So the presentation and disclosure requirements will still need to take into consideration. And when it comes to measurement, the measurement of those particular items we will need to, to deal with in terms of the related, the relevant standards. We'll come back to this a little later on. Where we'll talk about the various things that are outside of the scope of IFRS 5 when it comes to measurement. IFRS 5 starts off by dealing with a few issues. So there's definitions. So we're going to. So in this webinar, we'll deal with the with the issues that arise out of IFRS 5. We split them up into into four different categories. We'll start off by having a look at definitions, describing what a disposal group is, what a discontinued operation is, what a non-current asset held for sale is in itself. We'll then move over onto the held for sale criteria, what held for sale criteria needs to be met. Thirdly, we'll have a look at the accounting issues that arise. And here there's a myriad accounting issues that we need, we need to take into consideration. What happens where we classify something as health for sale and we still have it in the books 12 months, 12 months later. Or we find ourselves in a situation where the reporting criteria are only met after, after year end. Or we need to reclassify because we've had a change in our plan to sell, to sell the particular asset. So these sort of things we'll need to take into consideration as part of the process. Then the last thing that we'll look at will be around presentation and disclosure. When we're preparing our financial statements, what information do we disclose and why do we disclose it? How do we present the various things that need to be presented in our financial statements? So we'll start off by having a look at the definitions. Now, looking at the definitions, I'll start off with the, the very basic one. What is a non-current asset? Now, this goes way back to to IS-1, what we would have learned under IS-1, what have been told under IS-1. 
is a non-current asset is an asset that does not meet the definition of a current asset. So basically, I don't expect to realize the asset or set or sell the asset or consume the asset in my normal operating cycle. I'm not holding this asset with the intention of trading it. It's not, that's not the primary reason why this asset is, is exists in my books. If you look at the definition of a current asset again, I, I would expect that with a current asset, I expect to realize that asset within a 12-month period after the reporting date or it meets the definition of a cash and cash equivalent. Now, any of those scenarios would say, well, we've got a current asset, so therefore we would not apply this particular standard. Now, to be clear, IFRS 5 will only apply to the accounting of for a non-current asset where we've taken the decision to dispose of that non-current asset. If it relates to a current asset, we can't apply IFRS 5 to that particular in that particular scenario, unless that current asset forms part of a disposal group, which we're gonna talk about now. Now, if you look at the definition of a disposal group, a disposal group is a group of assets that will be disposed of, whether we want to sell, or we want to sell those that group of assets, or we want to distribute them to our shareholders, but we're gonna do all of this in one single transaction. So as a company, I might decide, well, I want to unbundle a division or a subsidiary company within my group of companies and hive it off and to my shareholders, or I'll sell it off as a going concern. Now, in that situation, everything is going to go in one fell swoop. So in that scenario, I would meet the definition of a disposal group. So I would not only be looking at just the assets that relate to this particular group, this disposal group, I'd also be looking at the liabilities that are directly associated with those those particular assets that will also be transferred as part of that transaction. Now, this is not to say that if I decide that I will hive off a particular division, but I will keep, keep, keep back some of the liabilities that relate to that particular division that I don't meet the definition of a disposal group, you can choose to structure your transactions in that particular fashion, take some things out and dispose of the rest. Maintain some things, and if it's a liability, for instance, they'll be retained in the company and you will settle them at a later stage. That's not a problem at all. You'll still be in a position where you still meet the definition of a disposal group. And because you meet the definition of a disposal group, well, you, you can apply the, the, the thinking that is sitting, the guidance that is sitting in IFRS 5. Again, just to be clear about what's included in a disposal group, you'll, you'll include in that disposal group any goodwill that is acquired in a business combination if the group is a cash generating unit to which goodwill has been allocated. Now for this, we need to turn back to IAS 36, the impairment standard, impairment of assets standard. And you'll remember that you'll recall that in IAS 36, it states that when you acquire a company, you acquire a business, and there is goodwill that arises on the transaction, you'll be required to go and allocate that goodwill to each cash generating unit that makes up that business that you have acquired. And there's a whole process that we follow in terms of IS-36 in allocating that goodwill to each cash generating unit that makes up that business. Now these disposal groups, I've alluded to this already, may consist of a group of cash generating units it may be a single cash generating unit. It may be a portion of a cash generating unit. Any one of those will work. So the common examples, as we've already, we've already said, if I'm holding a subsidiary with the intention of selling it, a cash generating unit, I've taken a division or I've taken a portion of a, of a division, something that on its own is able to, to generate its own revenues and its, pay its own expenses and so forth, that's a cash generating unit. As long as I meet the definition, then I can hold that as a disposal group with no with no qualms whatsoever. When an asset is sold individually, IFRS 5 applies only if the asset is a non-current asset. I mentioned it already when we're speaking about current and non-current assets. So folks, 
if you're dealing with current assets, you will not be in the scope of IFRS 5. The minute you're dealing with a non-current asset and you've taken the decision to dispose of it, then you are certainly within the scope of the standard. Again, if you take the decision that you want to sell a group of assets in a single transaction, now the classification and presentation requirements that IFRS 5 puts on the table will need to apply to that group, to that disposal group, because now you meet the definition of a disposal group. The standard also addresses discontinued operations. And it defines a discontinued operation as a component of an organization that has been disposed of or has been classified as held for sale. Now, when I'm talking about a component, we're basically looking at a portion of, of your organization that operationally, cash flow wise, it's able to generate its own cash flow, that it runs it as on its own. And from a financial reporting perspective, the reporting is done specifically for that particular section as well. So if I can distinguish this section that I'm disposing of, I'm hiving off on these three different levels, operationally, cash flow wise, and financial reporting wise, and I meet the criteria that is set out that, that follows, which I'm gonna talk about now, then basically I have a discontinued operation. So we're saying it's a component that has been disposed of or classified as health for sale, and at the same time represents a separate major line of business or geographical area of operations for your organization. Now these ones are all ors. Or is part of a single coordinated plan to dispose of a separate major line of business or geographical area of operations within my organization, or it it's makes up a subsidiary that I've acquired with the intention of reselling it. So maybe I saw an opportunity to make, to make some money, to make a quick profit. So I bought a business, but I intend on disposing of it straight away. The minute I've got any of those, I meet the criteria that we've got here then basically I have a discontinued operation on my hands. And if you've got a discontinued operation in your hands, we're certainly within the scope of this particular standard. Now, those are all the things that are within the scope of IFRS 5. There's a few more things that are not within the scope of IFRS 5, which we mentioned early on, which you said we'll come back to. Now, just to be, to make sure that we're all on the same page on this, the scope exclusions relate to the measurement requirements of IFRS 5. If I've got a non-current asset that I intend on disposing of, the presentation and disclosure requirements will still need to be dealt with in terms of IFRS 5. But the measurement, the measurement requirements may not. So for instance, if I was dealing with deferred tax assets, I need to go to IS 12 for that. The income taxes standard will give me guidance in terms of how I deal with that particular deferred tax asset. If I'm dealing with assets that arise from employee benefits, financial assets that are within the scope of the two financial instrument standards that we've got, IFRS 9 and IS 39, I go to those standards. Any non-current assets that are accounted for at fair value in accordance with IS 40, here I'm referring to investment properties, those are also dealt with. The measurement requirements of IS 40 will come into play here. Any non-current assets that are measured at fair value, less any cost to sell, in accordance with IS 41, here we're dealing with um, agricultural assets. So whether I'm dealing with biological assets or I'm dealing with, um, with, with the growing crops, those will be dealt with under IS 41. Any contractual rights under insurance contracts, those are dealt with in terms of IFRS 4. But folks, again, it's just the measurement requirements that, that don't apply. So the measurement requirements of IFRS 5 don't apply to these particular items, but the presentation and disclosure requirements certainly will. We've dealt with um, what we've got sitting on this stand, this particular slide. Just again, just to reiterate, exclusions relate only to the measurement requirements of IFRS 5. The classification and measurement, uh, classification and presentation requirements apply to all non-current assets, regardless of the fact that they might have been scoped out out of uh, IFRS 5 
measurement requirements. So that deals with the definitions and the scope section of this particular standard. The next section deals with the health for sale criteria that need to be met. While I summarize the health for sale criteria for you on this particular slide, I'm going to skip this slide for now and move on to the next one, but we'll come back to the criteria that we've got set out on this particular page. The five issues that we've got here, we'll still need to revisit in a little more detail. With regard to the classification of a non-current asset as held for sale or held for distribution, IFRS 5 categorically states that an entity shall classify a non-current asset or a disposal group as held for sale if its carrying amount will be recovered principally through a sale transaction rather than through use. So I've taken the decision at this point that I would like to dispose of, a, of an asset that I've got and I will to realize some cash out of that particular, that particular transaction. Now in that situation, I don't intend on using it, I intend on selling it, so therefore I'm within the scope of the standard. The minute I have that intention, I'm within, within the scope of, of IFRS 5, and within the ambit of IFRS 5, I then need to figure out which bits of IFRS 5 are applicable to what I'm doing. The five criteria that we skipped just now, those then come into play. I would need to understand them as part of my decision-making process. How do I intend on realizing this particular asset? Is it through sale? Is it through distribution to owners? Whichever of the two, I'll be on the right side of the of this particular standard. But the standard, the asset must be available for immediate sale. In its present condition, I don't have to go and do anything further to it. There are no repairs, nothing that need that need to be done to the asset. In its current condition, can I sell this asset? The terms of this particular sale will there be the sort of terms that are normal for that sort of asset when you look at how everybody else who deals in that sort of asset would normally contract. And is that sale highly probable? Again, is management committed to this plan of, on selling this asset? Now, how you show commitment, has a decision been made? So if it's a board that needs to take the decision to give the authority to sell an asset, has that authority been given? Has the company started actively looking for a buyer as well? So are we marketing this asset for a reasonable price? And when we're talking about marketing this asset for a reasonable price, is it the sort of number that is more or less in line with the fair value of this asset? If there's other assets that are for, available for sale in the market at that point in time, the number that we're looking for as the people that are looking to dispose of this asset, is it more or less in that ballpark? The minute you start asking for ridiculous prices for your for, for your assets, then that will then call into question whether or not you've got this commitment to selling the asset. You might have taken the decision to sell it to selling it, but are you actually in the market to sell it to sell it? Again, in the act, actively looking for a buyer, all the marketing activity around the asset, if it's advertising that needs to be undertaken, is that being done? And lastly, is the sale highly probable within 12 months of classification. If my answer to all of these things come back, comes back as a yes, the asset is available for immediate sale in its present condition, and we think that the transaction is likely to happen, management is committed, we're actively looking for a buyer, we're asking for a reasonable price, and we think that this is going to happen within 12 months of classification, then absolutely by all means, I will classify this as hell for sale. Now, I made the point earlier on that your intention must be to sell the asset, to realize the asset through sale or distribution. If my intention is to recover the carrying value of my asset through continued use, then I'm not in the scope of this particular standard just yet. Only when I meet all those criteria can I then show that asset as a non-current asset held for sale. 
if I take the decision that I want to temporarily take an asset out of service, again, I am not permitted to classify that asset as a non-current asset held for sale. If it's property, plant and equipment, I will continue to show it as part of property, plant and equipment. But because I've taken it out of service for a period of time, for whatever reason, I may then be, I may then need to consider IAS 36 on impairment as well while I'm at it. Because that in itself, the fact that I've taken it out of service may be an indicator that I may have an impairment related to that particular, that particular asset. Now, specifically with non-current assets that are to be abandoned, you may take the decision that, well, I don't intend on selling this asset. If anything, I'll just leave it and will leave everything as as is. I'll put on the on the on the um, on the scrap heap that's in the in the back of my my factory. Then that's fine. What you're doing there is you're abandoning the asset. So again, in that situation. Going back to the previous slide, I can't classify that asset as an asset that is held for sale. My intention is not to dispose of it via sale or through the distribution to, to, my, to my owners, to my shareholders. So in that situation, I couldn't classify it as a non-current asset held for sale. So this is an asset that'll be that'll be or simply be abandoned. So therefore I continue to use it the same way that I would. I'll continue to classify the same way that I would as if that asset were, 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 were to continue to be used. But again, in that situation, the thinking of IS-36 becomes paramount. So I don't only have an indicator. I think the fact that I'm chucking this thing, throwing this thing onto, onto the scrap heap indicates to me that I certainly have an impairment issue that needs to be dealt with. Now, specifically for assets that are to be abandoned, if I meet certain criteria, then the accounting that I need to apply in my books may be slightly different. So if the operation that I am looking to abandon represents a separate major line of business or geographical area of operations, or my intention is to dispose of it in a single coordinated plan, or it happens to be a subsidiary that I've acquired with the intention of reselling it, then in this situation, you'll see that the criteria that we've got here are the criteria that relate to discontinued operations, which we covered earlier on. So in that situation, because I'm dealing with a discontinued operation, then I'm required to present my results and the cash flow of that discontinued operation at the date on which I, it ceases to be used as part of it ceases to be part of it ceases to be used as um, as part of um, the continued operations within my organization. So at that point, I already have criteria. I already have disclosure requirements that I need to meet in order to make sure that I address this these particular concerns. There are a few accounting issues that arise out of the application of IFRS 5, a few practical issues that we need to, to bear in mind as well. Like I mentioned earlier on, what happens if I exceed the 12 months limit, the one year limit that we spoke about earlier on? What happens if I change my mind? What happens if I change the way that I plan on selling this asset? So all those things may have some impact on the process that we follow the consequences of having classified something as a non-current asset held for sale. We'll start off with the 12-month limit. The 12-month limit can be extended if events and circumstances beyond our control cause a delay in the process. But the only way that we can, that this extension can, can occur is that if there's sufficient evidence that the entity is still committed, still plans on selling this asset. I've had clients in the past where they've carried 
they've classified an um, assets, non-current assets as held for sale. Two years, three years down the track, those same assets are still sitting on their books. Now, if I take you back to 2008, when the financial crisis hit hit us um, for the first time, I don't think we've come out of it just yet, but financial cr uh, crisis hit us. At that point, if an organization took a decision to dispose of an asset, it might have taken them longer than the 12 month limit that we, that is imposed by the standard to dispose of that particular asset. So again, it was not necessarily because of, through any fault of their own. It just happened that the environment around them was not was not conducive to the disposal at that point. So as much as they might have been asking a reasonable price, as much as they might have been committed to selling the asset, as much as they might have been marketing the asset appropriately, and they met all the criteria that are that are required of us by the standard, it was just next to impossible to get anybody who would commit to the to, to the to the purchase. So in that situation, the standard would allow us to continue to classify that asset as a non-current asset held for sale. However, I would like to caveat to that. Like I said to you, two years, three years down the track, that same asset still sits on the balance sheet. Well, if that is the case, you'll probably find that it'll be harder and harder to argue the fact that you still meet the criteria, this extension criteria, after such a long time, unless, again, maybe the situation is so fluid that things keep changing from under your feet, keeps changing under your feet, and in that situation, well, it's very difficult to, 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 to consummate the transaction. Sometimes your plan to sell may involve the loss of control of a subsidiary company. Again, while I might own 75% of this entity at this point in time, I don't intend on disposing of the entire shareholding. I might only I might intend on keeping 15, 20% when I'm done. Now, if that is a situation, again, I'm looking at the cash, I'm looking at the disposal group that is that is the subsidiary company. That's what I'm disposing of. The asset that I will I will retain when I'm done, that will have a different classification altogether. So therefore, looking back into what IFRS 5 requires of us, because I intend on because I'm going to lose control of this particular subsidiary company, I will be required to classify all the assets, all the liabilities of that particular subsidiary company as held for sale, assuming that we meet all the health for sale criteria. I meet all the health for sale criteria, no problem. Show it as a non-current asset health for sale, then the measurement criteria will then kick in. We'll deal with the measurement criteria in a, in a, in a few moments. The fact that I intend on retaining a stake in the company, which is a non-controlling stake, does not change the answer that I get to. The fact that I may it may be an associate company when everything is said and done does not change the fact either. So whether it's a plain old financial instrument where I'd apply IS39 or IFRS92 or I would apply IS282 for associate company accounting or if it happens to be a joint venture when joint venture when, when we're done, all of that will not be of any consequence to the accounting that will need to be to be applied. I still meet the criteria for IFRS 5, so therefore apply it. Sometimes I acquire assets with the intention of selling them. We spoke about this early on. I've seen a profit uh, arbitrage opportunity. I can make a quick profit and walk away. I may need to rehabilitate the assets for a little bit, maybe hold, hold, hold on to them for six months, nine months or something, and then at that point, uh, you know, do a little bit of work to them and then dispose dispose of them. Or just hold on to them until the timing is right and then dispose of them. Now, in any of those situations, I've acquired those assets with the intention of reselling them. So if that is the case, again, classify that asset or that group of assets as held for sale at the acquisition date. But the only way that I can do that is I must meet certain criteria. 
Do I have the intention of disposing of the asset, all of the criteria that we had before? And do I think that I'll be able to do all of this within the next year? I've got one year in which to do to get all of this done. And at the same time, it must be highly probable that all the criteria that are not met for me to classify this as a non-current asset held for sale, the criteria that we spoke about earlier on, the intention, the authority, the marketing, all that criteria will be met and will be met within a short period of time. Now here there's a bright line that we've been given by the standard in the standard, which says, well, we'll give you about three months in which to make sure you get all your ducks in a row and for, the, for, for all the various authorities and marketing plans and so forth to be put in place. Again, because of the, the way that the wording is, is, um, is, um, is used in the standard, usually within three months, that implies that you could potentially go over that without too much of a problem. But I think any longer than three months without, a justif without proper justification, may be a little hard to swallow so you may it may be difficult for you to then explain yourself explain that you've applied the accounting the IFRS 5 accounting where you've not necessarily um, dealt with the letter of, of, of the guidance that is given in IFRS 5 when it comes to this sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where the health for sale criteria are not met until after the reporting date. Folks, if that is a situation that you find yourself in, you can't go back and say, well, we had the intention of disposing of the asset, but we hadn't received authority from our board yet because they hadn't met. Were the criteria met or not? There's five criteria that we need to meet. If the five criteria were not met at that point in time, then it basically means that, well, you are not in IFRS 5 just yet. What you may find yourself what you may find yourself with is a situation where the criteria if the criteria are met after year end but before the financial statements are authorized for issue then in that situation will be required to disclose as part of the notes to the financial statements what the non current asset or the non current assets or the disposal group that we're looking at are the facts and circumstances that led to your decision to dispose of the asset. So what is it that is driving this? How do you intend on disposing of the asset? And when do you intend on disposing of the asset? All of that must be disclosed as part of your part of your financial statements. And to the extent that you are in the space where you're applying IFRS 8 on operating segments, what is the reportable segment? in which that, that particular non-current asset or that particular disposal group falls under. So where are you presenting the numbers that relate to that particular item? So all of that must form part of the disclosure that you then provide in the financial statements to enable the user of the, of the financial statements to have a better understanding of what it is that has happened. But folks, remember, this is where we're saying, well, we didn't meet the criteria by year end. However, post year end, we have subsequently met all the criteria, and we have, but we have not yet finalized the financial statements. If the financial statements reporting process is finalized, but you have not yet necessarily gotten, all, you have not obtained all the, all the relevant approvals that are necessary, you haven't met all the criteria that are required of you, then in that situation, there will be no, this, this disclosure that we're referring to May not will not be applicable to you. To the, ex, to the extent that you would like to disclose the fact that you intend on doing something, but are still waiting on one or other criteria to be met, because IFRS does not provide you with a ceiling of disclosure that you, you're required to provide, if it's relevant to people understanding your financial statements, you may provide that disclosure. But please note the use, my use of language there you may provide, it's not a requirement, it's a choice that you're making because you think that it's relevant to people and better understanding where you are and what the organization is doing and how the organization is going to progress going forward.
Let's move on to the measurement that relates to non-current assets that are held for sale. We've taken the decision that we will dispose of, a, of an asset. We meet all the criteria for, for classification as a non-current asset held for sale. Now we're required to go and measure that asset. Standard says to us, we're required to measure the non-current asset at the lower of its carrying amount. So what is it currently sitting at in the books at present? And its fair value, less any cost to sell or distribute to owners at that point in time. So pick one of the two. Which one of the two is going to be, which one of the two is, well, work out what both of them are. Which one of the two is the lower? Then we go with the lower. If it's a newly acquired asset, and it happens to be part of a business combination, but we knew up front as we were entering into this business combination that there are certain parts of the business that we are acquiring that we have no interest in whatsoever, then in that situation, that business or that portion of the business or those particular assets, non-current assets, already meet, if they already meet the health for sale criteria from where you're sitting, then you measure those assets or that disposal group at fair value, less any cost to sell as part of that, that as, as part of that process. If the sale is expected to, to go beyond a year, it's expected to happen in longer than a year, then these costs that we're referring to in the fair value less cost to sell or distribute, we need to measure those costs at their present value. We can't take them as is because what, whatever, what, whatever, whatever cost we intend on incurring today will not be the same as the same cost in, incurred in 18 months' time in two years' time. So in that situation, the present value, present value computation, present value calculation becomes quite an important step in the process. As part of the measurement process, we may also be required to go to have a look to see whether or not there may be any impairment issues. So where the carrying value of our asset happens to be lower than the fair value less cost to sell, then we need to take an impairment loss immediately through the books. So there's no two ways about this. There's no negotiation. Again, if I take you back to the previous slide, we said we're measuring the asset at the lower of its carrying amount and fair value, less any cost to sell or, dist or distribute to owners. So therefore, if that fair value, less cost to sell number is a lower number, the, in the indication, the implication there for us is the asset is impaired, so therefore we need to, to recognize that impairment charge straight away. In recognizing that impairment charge, we fall back to the impairment, impairment rules that we have in, I, in IS 36 on impairment of assets. If I'm dealing with a single asset, no problem there, I simply allocate the impairment charge to that single asset. If I'm dealing with a group of assets, now in that situation, I may have a bit of a of a computation to do. I may have a bit of um, of um, you know s some playing around that I need to to do to some fancy footwork that I need to to do there in order to make sure that I can allocate those costs. But going back to what IS thirty six requires of us, IS thirty six simply asks the question: Well, this group of assets that you're dealing with, is there any goodwill that has been allocated to that group of assets? If it's a cash generating unit, for instance. Yes, I do have goodwill in that as part of that cash generator unit. So if I do have goodwill, allocate the impairment to that goodwill amount. That's your first port of call. If, I've do, if I do that and I still have some impairment left, some impairment that is, un, that is unallocated at that point, then I move over onto all the other assets that may, that remain. But in looking at all the other assets that remain, I also need to take into consideration that there may be certain assets that are already carried at fair value. Those assets, if I can determine what the, what the fair value is, I can, it's supportable, then I, t I put those aside. Those ca cannot have any impairment allocated to them because there's nothing in them that indicates that there may be a problem. Whatever is left after I've done that, whatever assets are left after I've done that, I will then allocate 
the remaining impairment to those assets on a proportionate basis. So again, those are the rules that we have in IS 36 that we need to take to, to bear in mind, we need to take into consideration as part of the process. If there is a subsequent increase in the fair value less cost to sell of the assets that we're dealing with, then the standards allows us then the standard allows us to go back and reverse any impairment losses that we may have recognized to that point. But in looking at this reversal of this impairment, these impairment uh, charges that we may have recognized, we are only permitted to reverse the impairment charges or we limited, the, the impairment uh, reversal is limited to the impairment loss that we've recognized. Now the impairment loss that we've recognized here will be both the impairment that has been recognized because of the application of IFRS 5 and the application of IAS 36. We might have had, we might have an asset that was impaired even prior to us classifying that asset as a non-current as, asset held for sale. So that impairment that, that, that impairment charge that has that was recognized in the past will be taken into consideration as part of the process of of, of what of um, determining what is permissible to be reversed ultimately as it relates to that particular asset now classifying an asset, as hell for sale has other implications as well. Early on, when I was giving you the overview, I said to you, well, it will have an impact on how we classify things on our statement of financial position, what we show in the statement of, of uh, profit of comprehensive income, if it's a disposal, if it's a discontinued operation, and so forth. We'll deal with this in a little in a little more detail when we get to the disclosure a little later on. But just to reiterate the point is that any assets that are classified as non-current assets will not be reclassified as current until the criteria to be classified as held for sale are met. Again, you also need to look at it in, of, from a depreciation point of view. If I'm looking at um, property, plant and equipment, any property, plant and equipment that I might have, I need to stop depreciating that property, plant, and equipment. Again, what I'm applying there is what is the lower of the carrying value of the asset and fair value less cost to sell. And I'll be required to present these items separately in my statement of financial position. If there are any changes in my plan to sell this asset, then at that point, I cease to classify the asset or the disposal group as held for sale. I no longer meet the criteria that we spoke about. And because I no longer meet the criteria, I need to go back and effectively reinstate the asset. So as much as I might have stopped depreciating an asset, if I was looking to jipo the books, for instance, this effectively would almost catch up with me because in reinstating the assets, I'll be required to go and measure the asset at the lower of its carrying amount before the classification is held for sale, but I need to adjust it for depreciation, for any amortization, any revaluation that would have been recognized had that asset not been classified as held for sale. So if I stopped depreciating an asset two years ago, and I've now taken the decision that I'm not gonna dispose of it, well, in year three, I will need to do a catch up on my depreciation. So all the depreciation that should have been recognized in years one and two will then be recognized in year three. So effectively, I'll, I will have a significant hit in that particular year. But I measure the asset at the lower off, the carrying amount before classification, and it's recoverable or after all the adjustments. And I compare that with the asset's recoverable amount at the date when the, dis, when the decision not to sell was taken. But remember, we're looking at the lower of the two numbers. So whichever way there may be, there will be a hit that is going through your books. So if recoverable amount happens to be a much higher number, well, 
your carrying value would certainly not have been because you would have been depreciating or you would have been amortizing the asset as you were going along anyhow. So therefore, there's the, the, that expense must still be taken through the books. That leads us to the final portion of the standard, which is the presentation and disclosure. Now, if you look at the presentation and disclosure section of IFRS 5, it starts off by saying, an entity shall present and disclose information that enables users of the financial statements to evaluate the financial effects of discontinued operations and disposals of non-current assets or disposal groups. Again, this goes back to what I said to you at the beginning, is that as a company, we've taken a decision that we want to dispose of a particular asset, a particular group of assets, got a disposal group. How is that going to impact what we are doing? That's effectively what we're trying to reflect in the financial statements. So the point of your financial statements is to reflect to the user of the financial statements the position that would obtain once, because of this decision that you've taken, the, the position that would obtain once this decision has been has has been seen has been seen to, and it's been undertaken. So what would ultimately remain in the company? What would remain on the company's balance sheet? To the extent that we're dealing with the discontinued op we're dealing with the discontinued operation, we'd also need to take into consideration what impact it would have on your on the results going forward. So from a disclosure perspective, we're required to show a single amount in the statement of comprehensive income that is made up of the post-tax profit or loss of the discontinued operations that that's what we're dealing with and the post-tax gain or loss that is recognized on measurement of measurement at fair value, less cost to sell of the assets, the asset, the assets or the disposal group uh, that we that we we've got at hand. And this this number that we're dealing with, well these two numbers, the post tax profit or loss um, of discontinued operations and, and the the gains and losses that arise from on, on the on the point of of, um, of classification, we need to analyze that number into what revenue has been generated by that particular discontinued operation. What expenses have been earned, have been incurred by that particular uh, discontinued operation? What is the pre-tax profit that has been generated or the loss that has been incurred? What are the gains and losses that relate to the measurement to fair value, less cost to sell, related to this particular group of assets? And for each of these two items, the related income tax expense to the extent that we've got one. This must come through in the books, in the disclosures. It doesn't stop there. We also require to have to disclose in the financial statements the cash flow impact relating to this particular decision that we've taken. So where our operating activities, inflows and outflows will be impacted. Well, what is the impact that um, this particular decision will have? Investing activities, financing activities, each one of these to the extent that they're impacted, what is the impact that this particular decision will have in each of these line items? We also require to show the amount of income that is attributable to the owners of the parent. And with this particular disclosure, show the split between, show the split of income that is attributable to the owners of the parent and split it up between what income is attributable to continuing operations and what income is attributable to discontinued operations. The reporting entity is also required to represent, so basically go back and restate your disclosures for prior periods that are presented in the financial statements. And the whole point behind this is that we need to be able to compare this year's statement of comprehensive income with last year's statement of comprehensive income. If they were prepared on a different basis, last year we hadn't taken the decision to dispose of the of, of that particular of that particular group of assets or that particular disposal group. So therefore we would not have shown that as part of discontinued operations. 
So if that is the case, in order for us to have to compare like um, like with like, we need to make sure that there is that representation that occurs, and to highlight the fact that these things are now presented on a like for like basis. So in the whole process of reclassification, we just need to be sure to be clear again. So the reclassification of current year of uh, prior numbers occurs in the statement of comprehensive income. In your statement of financial position, you don't represent. Again, remember your statement of financial position shows a snapshot at a point in time, at a date. So at the end of last year, we did not have, we had not taken the decision to dispose of a particular asset. So therefore, there's no need to go back and represent. But at the end of this year, this reporting period that we're in, we certainly have taken the decision. So in that situation, that that asset, that non-current asset held for sale, is shown as a separate line item in the in the separate classification non-current assets held for sale. The discontinued operations we dealt with, so we'll we'll leave that for now. Just from a presentation point of view. Any non-current assets classified as held for sale must be presented separately from other assets that are sitting in your statement of financial position. So you'll see how companies generally will disclose this. They'll show the non-current assets with the, the list of things that fall under non-current assets, property, plant and equipment. We might have, we might have investment properties. We might have long-term investments shown as non-current assets. Current assets, you'll have your debtors, your cash, you'll have your those sort of things, inventories sitting under current assets, and then there'll be a third classification, which will be your non-current assets held for sale, classified as held for sale. Now, if I've got, if I'm dealing with a disposal group that also consists of liabilities, then in the liability section of my statement of financial position, I'll do the same thing. Show my non-current liabilities, current liabilities, and then I'll have the third classification, non-current liabilities, classified as held for sale. My suggestion, and you can take this or leave it, would be for the non-current assets and non-current liabilities held for sale to have a note in the back of the financial statements that then explains, provides a breakdown of what has gone into those numbers. So non-current assets held for sale will have a supporting note, note number 22. Non-current liabilities will also have a supporting note. Make it the same note, note number 22. And in note number 22, I will then go into detail of what are the various assets, what are the various liabilities that have that meet this classification criteria. And in that, in that same note, I can then deal with when do I ex what led to the decision to dispose of this asset? When do I expect the, 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 the disposal to happen and so forth? You will see IFRS 5 has got what it calls additional disclosures. And in that additional disclosure section is all the various things that I'm talking about now. A description of the non-current asset that we're dealing with or the disposal group. A description of the facts and circumstances around the sale. Why are we disposing of this particular group of assets, this particular asset, this group of assets? And when do we expect to dispose of, of, the, of the asset? How do we expect to dispose of the asset? At the same time, in that same note, I can include in there what gains and losses are recognized on classification as health for sale. And this presumes that I've not disclosed this number elsewhere in my statement of comprehensive income. If I have, then there's no need for me to repeat myself. If I have not disclosed it, then I'd need to explain which line item in my statement of comprehensive income includes that gain or loss that arose on reclassification, on classification. If I apply segment reporting, again, I need to explain which segments, which segment or segments do the non-current assets that are held for sale or the disposal group, which segment do they belong in? And where there's been a change in the plan to sell the asset, but what has led to this change in, in, in my plan to sell the asset? So again, a description around the facts, the circumstances that led to the, to the change in my decision and what impact that particular change might have. So if I'm reinstating everything, again, I will have an additional depreciation charge, for instance. I need to explain that. So this is what has happened as part of the process. 
One last thing that I have not spoken about, which also um, forms part of IFRS 5 and has come through as a as, a, as an amendment in the last um, in, in the last year as part of the um, improvements project from the ISB, is that if you took a decision, for instance, and this is just talking to the point about the change in the plan, if you took a decision, for instance, to dispose of an asset through sale, and then at some point, because there were no takers or for whatever reason you decided not to sell the asset, but maybe you were going to unbundle the, 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 the asset, if it's a group of assets, you're going to put it into a separate vehicle and you're going to hive it off and, um, and bundle, it to, bundle it to your shareholders. So basically you have a script dis, uh, distribution to your shareholders. While there's a change in the, in the plan to dispose of the asset, it is still being disposed of. So therefore, that period of a year that you had, 12 months that you had in which to have to execute the plan, that period, that time frame does not reset at the point at which you decide to change your plan. We still carry on as normal. We still carry on as if it's a. You still carry on as if it's um. The clock started ticking at the point at which the initial decision was made. So therefore, the 12 months. The 12 months will, will still run to the same date as you had to, as you had to begin with. In the event that you get to the 12 month period, and but you have not been able to, to to complete the transaction, again you'd ask the questions: Am I still committed? Do I still have the intention? And if all those boxes are ticked, then again you can you your classification as a non-current asset held for sale will still be appropriate.